the recording should have started. Could you confirm me that you have yes. the message? Perfect. Yes. yes. So, David, please, your turn. Okay, so thank you, Valentina, for the introduction. Thanks to all the organizers for inviting me. I hope you can hear me well and you can see my screen that uh, now is empty. And uh, um, of course, thanks to the participants for being here. Today, I will uh, speak uh, about uh, Subramanian geometry. So this is uh, my first uh, slide here. And uh, so the title of the course is Subramanian Curvature in Three-Dimensional Contact Manifolds. And actually, I will use uh, the two parts uh, to, to somehow separate uh, two different things. Today I want to give kind of introduction to subrimanent geometry, very basic, uh, very, very general, so I apologize with those that already know what I'm going to talk about and uh, I am using uh, my tablet today. So if you get annoyed by my writing, then you can uh, wait for tomorrow. I try to use slides, but I hope you can read. If you cannot read or have any question, of course, you can interrupt me. And so uh, the idea is that today I will speak about uh, more in general uh, subliminal geometry and tomorrow uh, focus more on uh, three-dimensional contact uh, Subramanian geometry, which is also at the core of the interaction with uh, the other uh, courses, as one of Patrick that we have already uh, seen, and um, our discussions. So, um, uh, since this is a kind of short course, I also um, advertise, let's say, that uh, on my website, there are um, there is more material. Of course, today I will speak about uh, kind of introduction to subliminal geometry, but I will be forced to be short. So, if you want to to know a little bit more, there are some videos on uh, on my web page because now remote courses are uh, are standard somehow. So there are two kinds of courses, let's say, a short one and a long one. And there is also a book I have written with uh, two colleagues, Andrei Grachov and Hugo Boscain. So you can have a look to, to this material where you can have, uh, uh, say, more uh, formal uh, statements and, uh, and proofs, which I will not go into the details today, of course. So uh, this is uh, my email. To contact me if you if you need and um, a s list of references I will give you uh, more precisely maybe tomorrow at the end of uh, of the slides presentation. Okay, so uh, let me start. So uh, I start with a very elementary and standard example, which is uh, the model of monocycle in the plane. So you you might think to this as a, a small car with two wheels or monocycle, uh, which um, uh, of course lives in the plane. So to if you want to speak uh, about configuration space of this mechanical system, let's say of course we are in some three-dimensional space because we have the position of the car, the two coordinates, and then some angular coordinates. Okay, so. Um, the angular coordinates uh, is the one which gives the orientation of the car. So the configuration space is, uh, is three-dimensional, but if we model this, uh, uh, this monocycle with, um, um, as usual, with, with the admissible movements that, it, that he can do, it has only two uh, allowed movements, only two admissible movements. The first one is the rotation around its position, and in the coordinate x, y, theta, it is represented by simply d over d theta. Okay, this is a vector field in the three-dimensional space, which you can think as r3 or r2 times s1. Okay, so the configuration space is r2 times s1, let's say. And uh, a second uh, movement, which is allowed by our 
system is uh, uh, this one, which is cosinus of theta d d x plus sinus of theta d y, which means simply that we can move uh, straight along the direction uh, we are uh, at some moment. Okay, so we have two movements moving in the, in the straight uh, forward back direction and a rotation in the same position. Uh, we have a constraint so in the allowed movements because we are in the three dimensional space, but we have only two movements. But uh, mm, the experience, also the, the, the true life experience, tells us that there is no constraint in the position. So, mm, in, uh, uh, this means that we can reach from any initial state any, any other final one, uh, but uh, in the way we can reach this position is not arbitrary. And uh, this is related to the fact that uh, we have a non commutativity of these two movements. So I, here I'm using the word movements for, for vector fields because, as you know very well, the flow of, uh, of the vector field uh, produce, uh, produce uh, what we can think to uh, integral curves, so a movement in the configuration space. And uh, the Lie bracket between these two vector fields is given uh, here. and uh, it, uh, it produces indeed a movement which is orthogonal to the position of the car. Okay, indeed, it's kind of sliding in the orthogonal direction of the car. Okay, what happens here is that uh, our two vector field, x1, x2, and the early bracket are linearly independent, indeed, at every point. You can produce the matrix with the coefficient of this vector field and see that the determinant is uh, never zero. So, uh, since the, the, at this point, let, I will just observe that these three are, are linear independent at every point. Okay. Good. Uh, what happens uh, indeed uh, when we want to, to park our car? We do uh, exactly uh, the non admissible movement. Okay. We approximate the, um, uh, okay. the non admissible May movement I with some. Sorry? May I interrupt you already? Because I see there is a question from Patrick. Uh, yes. Actually, it's not a question, but I wanted to point out that David is beginning with the same example that I did. And I thought he would say it more explicitly. But so, so for people who are confused, this is the very same contact manifold that I've yes, started yes, yes. with. <laughs> yes, 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 of course. I wanted just to, to say it here because uh, as you see, this uh, distribution is uh, exactly uh, I, I did not speak, uh, I, I did not use the word distribution, but indeed you're right, thank you, Patrick. And uh, this is uh, indeed the, the very same uh, uh, contact distribution. So I, I wanted to, uh, to tell you, of course, but uh, thank you for saying it uh, already. Uh, so um, indeed, so let me add a few words because it's, uh, otherwise it seems uh, I am omitting something. So indeed what we can do here is uh, to, uh, to see this uh, couple of vector fields as spanning a distribution. So let me write it here. D is the span of x1, x2. And of course, we can see D as a kernel of uh, some one form omega. So uh, defining actual distribution of plane in this three-dimensional space. And uh, um, uh, and uh, uh, of course, we can write explicit form for omega. This is not difficult. It's just uh, uh, given by sinus theta uh, dx by cosinus theta dy. And uh, uh, one can check this is a contact distribution, actually. Okay? The fact that this contact distribution is uh, related with, uh, with this property here of uh, the Lie bracket of the two vector field being linearly independent okay, at every point. Very good, just uh, continuing with this uh, say very elementary example, just to give a flavor of what is happening here from this uh, viewpoint of a mechanical system. So of course, uh, um, let me say that uh, what Patrick called the genre curves, so that are curves that uh, um, whose tangent vector are in, in the distribution, uh, indeed corresponds to uh, what in the, in the example, in the mechanical example, are uh, admissible movement. Okay, and so for instance, uh, between admissible movement, we have a non-admissible movement. We have uh, the, uh, of course, the the flow of the two-vector field 
x1 and x2 we, we have chosen. And um, let me uh, just uh, focus here on this uh, uh, small picture. Of course, we have our can here, which we put in the point 0, 0 with orientation equal to 0. And imagine that you want to uh, park your car. What you do is the usual uh, parking maneuver, which uh, consists in, say, small, uh, four small movement, which is you go forward, then you turn your car, then you go backward, and then you uh, change your angle in order to go to the initial position. Okay, so it is exactly a combination of. Uh, of movement of, of this form and what happens when you uh, look it in the three-dimensional space is exactly this one and uh, at, at zero zero our two vector field uh, produce a vertical plane because if you go back to our formulas you have that the first vector field is uh, dd theta and the second vector field is just ddx when theta is zero okay so D, let me write it, D at zero, zero, zero is just the span of the X and the theta. Uh, but when you, <clears throat> when you say compose these uh, four movements as uh, here, you go first along the, the X axis because you are moving forward, then you change your angle. But then when you go back, you see that uh, you don't stay, of course, on the, on the same parallel line, but you move a little bit in this direction and going back, you, uh, you will not go to the, to the initial state because the two, uh, the two movements are, uh, uh, are not commuting. Okay? The two vector fits are not commuting. So um, what happens here is that uh, starting from any initial position, you can reach any final one. And this is related to the fact that the D bracket is uh, linear independent uh, from the two vector fields, and, uh, or if you wish, uh, the fact that the, our distribution is contact. Okay, in this case, um, uh, this is quite natural because if you interpret this into, into this way, with this uh, example, the car in the plane, it's quite natural to understand even without computation or without knowing what is the bracket that, uh, um, that it is possible to reach any final uh, configuration starting from any initial one. But in general, um, this kind of example or mechanical system, uh, in, for more general situation, it might be, say, uh, less trivial to understand if it is always possible to reach uh, uh, any final configuration starting from an initial one. So let us consider uh, this example of rolling boats, so, which is depicted here very, very simply. So um, uh, what do we have? We have two boats, um, to two boats in, in R3, two spheres if you wish. Um, the first one of radius R1 and the second one of radius R2. And uh, you might imagine that uh, the big ball R1 is uh, fixed, does not move, and R2 is rolling over uh, the ball number one of radius R1. So we want uh, this movement uh, to be rolling without uh, slipping nor twisting, okay? So uh, indeed, we cannot uh, twist our ball R2 around itself, so this movement of twisting uh, the ball number two um, maintaining the same contact point is not allowed and what we can also not do is to, um, to slip uh, the ball and uh, have a kind of translation okay maintaining the same configuration okay uh, one simple way also to think of this example is to put r1 equal to uh, infinity and uh, to transform the, the big ball into a plane Okay, so this is what happens when you uh, play uh, billiard or pool. Uh, um, okay, and uh, in this case, the configuration space is uh, five dimensional because uh, to identify a configuration of this mechanical system, we need one point over the first sphere, one point in the second sphere. This makes four uh, coordinates. And then we have also to fix uh, an angle, which is the orientation uh, of the two balls, one with respect to the, each other. You might think this to 
as an isometry between uh, the two tangent plates. Okay, so this is uh, an element of uh, SO2. So, um, five dimensional manifold, but uh, uh, two dimensional distribution here because um, uh, the no slipping, no twisting condition, if you wish, kills three admissible movements in this five dimensional space. Okay, and uh, uh, in this case, uh, it is, uh, um, say, at least uh, for me, not immediate to understand or to answer to the uh, same question as before. Is it possible, starting from an arbitrary initial configuration uh, of the two uh, balls, uh, to roll the small one into uh, an arbitrary final uh, configuration? Okay. And uh, indeed, in this case, the distribution is not a contact because it's, uh, it's a two dimension and we are in a five dimensional manifold. Uh, but um, if you work out the details, and uh, it is a, a quite interesting application of Frobenius theorem, or if you wish, the Chorashevsky theorem, which we will see in a while. Uh, to see that the answer is yes, if and only if R1 is different from R2. Okay, so if the two radius are different, then you can uh, go from any initial configuration to any final one. If the two radius are equal, uh, this is not possible. Okay, maybe intuitively it is uh, uh, not difficult to understand the case when the two radius are equal, because in this case, uh, um, I mean, you might imagine two equal sphere rolling one onto each other, and in this case, you can see that if you draw a small loop on uh, one sphere and you move the second one uh, along this loop, when you go back to the initial point, the configuration is exactly the same due to the symmetry of the system. And indeed, what happens is uh, that, uh, in general, if the radius are different, when you draw a loop here, then you will go back to the same contact point, but you will have changed a little bit the orientation. Okay, so indeed the uh, the twisting, uh, the twisting, so the dd theta, which we had before, it is in approximated by a first order Lie bracket, but uh, the slipping is a second order Lie bracket. Indeed. Okay, so let me formalize a little bit more this. So this small introduction was just to give a kind of a, a alternative uh, viewpoint on what we have already said, as Patrick uh, correctly uh, observed. And uh, so let me just recall more formally what happens is that when we have two vector fields, X and Y, we can consider the Lie brackets either as a, a operator, differential operator on function, because vector field differentiates functions, and uh, we have this formula here. So uh, this uh, mm, Lie bracket is still a vector field which is zero uh, uh, if the, the vector field commute as, a, uh, as a operators. So it's just the fact that this quantity is zero. But the geometric uh, interpretation we had before is, uh, uh, is the following that when you uh, take the composition of uh, the flow of the first vector field, then the second, then minus the first vector field, minus the second, so it is a, a standard exercise to show that indeed, uh, applying this composition to some initial point x0, then uh, the final point will be x0 plus a correction term, which is of order 2 in t. Okay, notice that here I am applying uh, say I'm following the vector fields uh, uh, four times for the same amount of time t. And uh, the final, uh, uh, say, movement with respect to initial point is of order t squared, okay? And the moral of the story is that uh, when this Lie bracket is independent on the two vector field, then combining movements of x and y, you can generate new direction. And this is uh, the basis of, uh, 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 of this definition of uh, Subriman geometry. And uh, if you think in the 
uh, in the examples we have discussed before, if X and Y are our allowed movements, which should be uh, vector fields which are tangent to the distribution, uh, which in the end will be a contact distribution, then um, the fact that the bracket is independent is exactly uh, allowing us to uh, reach any point of our uh, manifold with uh, horizontal curve or Legendre curves in case we speak about uh, contact distribution. So, of course, uh, feel free to, to interrupt me uh, if needed. And uh, so let me I, be a I little think, bit. I think, I think I will interrupt you because there is a question on the chat, uh, which I don't find now. I don't find the chat anymore. Um, the question is, should the bracket term be first order in T? Uh, you need to click on the bubble, Valentina, uh, up next to the... Yes, okay, now I found it, yeah, sorry. <laughs> so the question is on this formula, if here we have T, did I understand correctly the question? Yes, that's the question. Yes. So, so Actually not. This is indeed the point. This is the main point. The correction is of order t square. Uh, this is, a, if you wish, a, a computation that one can do in different ways, but uh, it is a key point that the, the correction is of order t square. So the idea indeed uh, is that uh, combining admissible movements in the end can uh, indeed uh, reach any point, but the direction corresponding to the Lie brackets, first order Lie bracket, will be reached by order t square with some amount of effort which is proportional to t. And then, of course, if we iterate this procedure and if we can, uh, if you have a dimension of the manifold which is bigger than three, like in the case of the two balls, we have five dimensional manifold, we can have higher orderly bracket, I will discuss it in a while, and in this case you can have third orderly bracket, in that case we can reach the direction but with order T3. This makes uh, non-homogeneous geometry somehow, with different uh, degrees, let's say, in different directions. This is uh, one of the um, uh, main features of actual this geometry. So, going back to the definition, some more formal definition. So, a subriemannian structure or subriemannian manifold, it will be a smooth manifold, so we call M. The dimension of the manifold, I will take it for this talk to be bigger or equal than 3. And then we have a vector distribution, D, uh, which we can think here as a subbundle of, of the tangent space. Actually, uh, we can have a more general situation where D is not necessarily a subbundle of uh, Tm, so it may have a rank which is uh, which depends on on the point. Okay, in that case, we can allow the dimension of the manifold, for instance, to be also equal to two, with a vector distribution which which is a rank uh, which is rank uh, dependent. And uh, mm, but let's stay with this on, on this talk and the G an inner product on the distribution. So what is the idea of this data here? The idea is that on our manifold M, which you can think as before as a configuration space of something and with a vector distribution, which is uh, uh, describing admissible movements, then I can consider admissible curves or horizontal curves or Legendrian curves in the case we have discussed before, which for me will be a Lipschitz curve defined on some interval that is on the manifold, such that the derivative of the curve, which exists almost everywhere with this assumption, uh, belongs to, to the distribution. Okay, so curves that are, uh, was the derivative is almost everywhere in the, in the distribution. You can replace, if you wish, uh, absolutely continuous here in this definition. I mean, of course, it's not the same, but it will, um, it will give an equivalent uh, definition of the distance we are defining in a while. And um, 
uh, for those curves, so that are tangent to the distribution, we can define a length. So that's the difference when you introduce a metric structure uh, here, and you don't discuss just the distribution, uh, because then you can use a standard formula to define what we call subremanent distance uh, in this case. So it's just the integral of the norm of, of the uh, integral of the speed of the curve. And then this allows us to define uh, the sublimited distance as the infimum of the length of curves that are admissible and joined to fixed points. So indeed, uh, you might think also this uh, as a you know, preferred Riemannian manifold where you restrict the class of curves that you consider. And you take as a class of curves some curves that are tangent to a given distribution. Okay. So the first question, is this a true distance? Of course, is important here. And uh, this is related to the, um, uh, this is related to the fact, uh, to the Lie bracket uh, that, uh, that we have discussed before, of course, and uh, to the fact that given an initial and final configuration on the manifold, uh, it's possible to have an admissible movement, which will permit us to reach it. So um, let us consider in the general situation. So here, n is the dimension of the manifold. And uh, let us consider a distribution which is spanned by, the, by a certain number of vector fields, x1, xk. And uh, this is always possible locally. But um, indeed, um, up to technicalities, which I won't discuss here, indeed, you can always work with uh, a global uh, family of global vector fields, which spans your distribution even uh, on, the, on the main, even when the rank is not uh, constant. OK. And um, so, um, the, the condition we have seen before is generalized in this way. This is the content of the Rashevsky Chow theorem. If the dimension of the Lie algebra generated by these vector fields at the point X is maximal at every point, what is called bracket generating or, or Mander condition, because there is a relation with the hypoelectricity of uh, some differential operator, I will not mention, but I think there is also a course dedicated to this. So I think we will get back to this. Then this uh, subliminal distance is a true distance and the metric space uh, which we um, define with this distance is uh, a metric space whose topology, the metric topology is equivalent to the manifold topology. Okay, so uh, the two, the, 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 topology, the topology defined by, by the metric is equivalent to the, to the one um, which is the, the locally Euclidean one. Okay. Here, this uh, symbol here just means the span of all iterated Lie brackets uh, defined by the vector field x1, xk. And maybe the, the simplest case to understand is uh, uh, the case with two vector fields. Then in this case, this Lie x1, x2 at the point x just means the span at point x of the two vector fields, their Lie bracket, because with two vector fields, you can just build one Lie bracket because the Lie bracket is Q symmetric. So vector field with itself, the Lie bracket is zero. And then we have more iterated Lie brackets, which in the um, case of two vector field are two, Lie brackets of order three in this way, and then of course you have more. So in the case of uh, the rolling balls, you can check that uh, the two admissible movements. I invite you, if you wish, to do the computation, which are a little bit uh, long but nice. Uh, the Lie bracket indeed is uh, five dimensional, and these five vector fields here are linearly independent. Okay, at every point as soon as the two radius are different. When the two uh, radius are equal, the distribution defined by these two vector fields is Frobenius integrable. So indeed, these three vector fields are proportional to x1, x2, in the model generated by, by this. 
Okay, so essentially the Rochevsky Chow theorem uh, says that uh, there exists an admissible curve or horizontal curve uh, joining every pair of points. And so it makes sense for us to speak about length minimizers. So we have the geometry more than the distribution because we have photometric on it. And so there are length minimizers, which are admissible curves where the length is equal to the distance of the endpoints of the curve. And uh, as standard in geometry, the natural question are existence of length minimizers and necessary conditions. So I will be short on existence and then discuss a little bit more necessary conditions, which are related to the uh, usual notion of geodesics. Okay, so today I will speak around this, this notion. So the existence of length minimizer indeed is quite related to the completeness of the, the sublimary distance that we have introduced, because indeed we have the following theorem, which is saying that if we have a, a, a ball, a sublimary ball, which has compact co closure, so this is the notation for the closure of sublimary ball centered at x and of radius. R, uh, then for any point y in this ball, there exists a length minimizer um, joining x and y, so as in this picture. And uh, since the topology is locally compact, then balls, small balls for a fixed x, small r, the ball has compact closure. So for a small r, no problem. We have uh, always length minimizers joining close points, but a priori, if you want the validity for all R, uh, we need to ask completeness of, of, the, of the metric space. And indeed, the two conditions are, turns out to be equivalent. A third equivalent condition, which is also interesting, is that uh, uh, the completeness is equivalent to the existence of a single radius for which all balls of this radius have compact closure. So this makes, for instance, um, subremanent structures on Lie groups always complete because using left invariant, so left invariant structures on Lie groups always complete. Okay, so uh, an important point of this conference was to speak about open questions. So one reason I decided to do this introduction is to illustrate the main open questions in the, in the topic. The first one is already here because we have said topology of the um, subremanian manifold is equivalent to the manifold topology, so it's locally Euclidean. Uh, we will discuss at the end, or almost at the end, that Subriman balls in general are not diffeomorphic to Euclidean balls. So this we know that in general, even small balls are not diffeomorphic to Euclidean balls. They have singularities, but we don't know in full generality if small subriman balls, because small is a natural um, situation to look at, we don't know if they are homeomorphic to Euclidean balls. And I like to say it here also because uh, uh, I, uh, I like to say it here because uh, so since the topology uh, workshop and also this uh, 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 open question is a little bit, uh, uh, I mean, there is not a lot of people working on this, so it's interesting to, to tell to you this, uh, this fact. So, uh, but now we go back to length minimizers. Is there any question? Uh, I've seen, I, I am seeing something appearing, but I have no time to read. So I sometimes uh, I try to read, but then I don't catch. So if there is something, please uh, tell me. There are just some comments I, in the chat, but they are nothing to, that needs to interrupt the lecture. Okay, okay, yes. That's why, that's yeah, exactly. that's why I didn't yes. interrupt you. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. I, I see something appearing and then uh, I don't have the time to, to, to catch the full question. So, uh, given two points, then can I, the notes. Can, um, can, can you say maybe what um, the definition of your distance you, you uh, ask for Lipschitz maps? Uh, what happens if you just look at smooth maps? 
Yes, indeed, what happens uh, in this setting is uh, you get the same distance. Uh, the, the fact that uh, I use the lip sheets is just because uh, uh, for lip sheets it's very easy to see that, for instance, the distance satisfies the triangular inequality. Because uh, indeed, uh, the class of curves that you have when you join two curves that are lip sheets, still lip sheets, but uh, okay. when you join to smooth, it's just piecewise smooth. So, uh, okay. One can work piecewise smooth, or I mean, there are different possibilities, and um, actually, in this setting, it turns out th this distance is the same. Okay. But it's just a technical. But Mark, thing. from a metric point of view, this class of Lipschitz map is just much more natural. I mean, yeah. I mean if you yes, yes, put a metric course. space, I mean, you can define Lipschitz map. You cannot define smooth map if you only have a metric space. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, is, uh, it is true, thank you, uh, Patrick. Maybe I um, take advantage of this comment to say that here, when I'm, so I'm going back, I'm, I'm sorry, when I'm writing Lipschitz here, actually, um, I'm not saying Lipschitz with respect to this distance, which comes later, but this is Lipschitz uh, with respect to the uh, manifold structure. So it's, uh, say, we should say locally Lipschitz, actually, okay? So a local ellipsis curve, which means that in coordinates it is local ellipsis, no matter on the constant. Okay. So if you prefer, you can replace absolutely continuous. In the end, it's the same. I like this ellipsis, but uh, it's true that it makes maybe some confusion with ellipsis with respect to the distance. So, but here is ellipsis in coordinates. Let's say. So thank you for your comments. Uh, so the length minimizer, um, the length minimizer uh, um, question uh, can be written as follows: uh, fix two points and then denote by omega x y the set of horizontal curve between the two points, and then uh, if you want to look for length minimizer, we have to minimize length over curves in this. In this set. So, um, as in Riemann geometry, one can replace length with energy. So the integral of uh, of the uh, of the speed squared. Okay, more or less with the same proof. So I add no no comment on this. This is a constraint minimization problem, and uh, when you have regular constraint, you have Lagrange multipliers rule. Uh, you know very well. So, um, but if the constraint is not regular, then uh, the Lagrange multipliers rule uh, must be adapted a little bit. So now I will make a comment, which maybe will look very elementary, but uh, uh, it is important to uh, uh, to look at it in the context of uh, subremanent geometry. So I will try not to annoy you with this comment. But if you look for infimum of some function L on some zero level set of a smooth function G. So here for me, L and G are smooth. I wrote in dimension two, but in RN, if you wish. If you have a point X zero, which is a solution to this problem, and the gradient of the constraint is not zero, or maximal rank, if uh, the, the G is a vector function, then, there exists lambda such that lambda gradient of G equal to the gradient of L. In general, you have this formula here for the, for the Lagrange multipliers. Okay, so the lambda are the Lagrange multipliers. But a priori, you can have a solution also at the point x0 where the gradient is zero, which is not a regular point of the constraint. And uh, to catch really all minimizers, one should write a little bit more general formula, meaning the existence of a pair lambda nu satisfying this identity here. And the nu, uh, lambda nu is a projective pair, so indeed you are reduced to nu equal to zero or one. So if nu is one, we are back to the previous formula. If nu is zero, you uh, are saying that uh, the gradient of, uh, of G is zero. So your point where the, where the gradient of the constraint is, uh, is zero or critical point of the constraint. So uh, nice example, I 
like to 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 show up is this one. If you minimize the function x just x over the smooth uh, level set of the smooth function x three minus on x to power three minus y power two uh, equal to zero, then uh, the minimum is exactly at uh, at the point where the gradient of uh, of the constraint is zero. And if you look at solution here, of course there is no no solution because the gradient of L is, is never zero. So uh, from this viewpoint, uh, this is uh, an abnormal minimizer. And now I try to, to explain you what, what does it mean. Because in this uh, geodesic problem in supplemental geometry, you have normal and abnormal. And this is an important uh, difference with Riemannian geometry. And so before adding details, let me maybe try to formalize things. But keep in mind this very simple example. So to better describe the problem, I fix the initial point, x0. So x0 is fixed. And then what I do, I describe horizontal curves through what we call, or are called in control theory, controls, this function u. Because I'm writing that gamma dot is uh, horizontal, so belongs to the distribution. Here, the distribution is spanned by this vector field. And so here I've written that gamma is horizontal because the derivative is in the distribution. And uh, the energy, this is not the length, but this is the energy. Uh, is uh, uh, is uh, takes this form. Uh, indeed, here I forgot to say x1, xk are also orthonormal. Okay, not only basis for distribution, but also orthonormal for the metric. Okay. Good. So, given u and given the initial point x0, I produce. Uh, an integral curve going from for some time t, and then I can uh, write down endpoint map here, endpoint map, which is the map associating to some control u the final point gamma u of t. And then our geodesic problem is just rewritten this form where the, the space where we minimize is the space of u. u is a function, and here I did not write which set. Uh, natural set in the setting I have um, introduced would be L infinity for uh, control U because the curve we consider are Lipschitz. But indeed, if you want to use some function analysis, it's practical also to use uh, L2 as a set of controls here. So L2 will give a class of uh, curves which is between absolutely continuous and uh, Lipschitz, and uh, in the end, you get the same distance. So you are allowed to do that. And uh, uh, so this is the problem now. You see that you have a true, a true constraint level set of some map. The map is this endpoint map, and it is smooth. So what happens is that in the remaining geometry, this map is always a submersion at every u. So you can always apply Lagrange multipliers rule, say in the first form, without the new. But in submersion geometry, it may happen, and it, it happens that solutions to this problem occurs at point where this endpoint map is not a submersion. And these are called normal and abnormal minimizers. OK, so let me be more precise. So if you take uh, length, space. Sorry, uh, can I can I ask a question about the previous slide? Yes, of course. Sorry, it's it's never an end, uh, never a submersion. You mean never a submersion at every point? You want to say? Well, yeah. So maybe I don't understand yeah, okay, this yeah. this endpoint map, yeah, sorry, but it's yes, sort of moving sorry, in the yeah, distribution. Sorry, right? yes, okay. yes. What what um, what I want to say is that uh, say the differential is uh, uh, might be surjective or not. Okay. So indeed, in Riemann geometry, at every u, the differential is subjective. Okay, in sub-Riemann geometry, indeed, what happens is that uh, 
in say the true case of subliminal geometry so when the distribution of the rank that is smaller than the dimension of the manifold indeed for u equal to zero the differential is never subjective okay so indeed it's true what you are saying so thank you i maybe i was using the word submersion in a, a way that it was working for my brain but not for the true definition <laughs> i hope this solves the the confusion and so if you take a length minimizer which is associated to some u bar then what you have is that uh, so this is a way of uh, uh, producing this relation i've written before in the case of uh, of the simple uh, rm situation say for u close to u bar you have that uh, the end point for all controls which brings us to the same end point so like here the energy is smaller okay so in particular if you take a map which is built so kind of extended endpoint map you extend your endpoint with adding one variable the energy this map cannot be open it cannot be open because if this is if the map is open this is not possible okay if the map is open you would find some u with the also values of j that are smaller, okay? So indeed, this is the Lagrange multipliers rule. This is the differential of this map, is not subjective, okay? So this gives the appearance of the two, lambda and nu, okay? So when nu is equal to one, because as I said before, this is a projective pair, you have a normal equation, if you wish, for u or for the corresponding curve, and when nu is zero, is abnormal, okay? You have two classes. These two classes are not necessarily necessarily with empty intersections because you can have a, a, a same U but with different pair that have a, a solution: one with new equal to one and one with new equal to zero. So the normal ones are those. Uh, as you might understand, which uh, are standard ones, which comes in, in Riemannian geometry also. In this case, length minimizer corresponding to normal are projection of an autonomous Hamiltonian system. The Hamiltonian is written here is a kind of co-metric, and uh, it is indeed one half of kind of co-metric square. Okay, the Hamiltonian one half of norm of lambda square one could say but in this case this is not norm and this is a smooth function here and uh, and so uh, it is important this uh, this fact that if the data are c infinity this h is c infinity and it comes out that given a length in miser you can find the lift p of t which is kind of vertical part of this corrector such that the pair gamma of t p of t as a curve in the cotangent space solves the Hamiltonian uh, differential equation associated to h, okay? Uh, so h r over here is the Hamiltonian vector field, you know very well what does it mean, but I'm writing here a coordinate expression. It turns out as a corollary that normal length minimizer, so length minimizer which comes out from this part of the necessary condition, R of class C infinity. And then we have a second open problem. Are all length minimizers of class C infinity? We don't know because as, uh, the, the point is that the necessary condition for the other case here, when you kill this, then you have no more, uh, I mean, uh, this equation depends on you actually. It is always of Hamiltonian kind, but uh, it is an Hamiltonian equation which depends on you. So there is no gain of regularity. Of course, I cannot really go into the details, but the point is that uh, uh, you cannot apply bootstrap. You have not, no regular equation. So um, we don't even know if they are C1. Of course, when I write open question, I should go more in the details and say in which settings we know the answer and uh, some partial results, but this also would take time. So 
at, for the moment, and maybe this question is not interesting for you. So uh, I'm just stating the question. If you have comments on that, we can go more into details. So how much time do I have? Because it seems I'm getting late or maybe not. 10 minutes. 10 minutes. OK, so uh, let's try to uh, say uh, more things. So what happens in dimension three? Assume we are in dimension three and we have a distribution which is of dimension two, or rank two maybe I should say, with an orthogonal frame, x1, x2. So in this case, the, the contact condition for distribution is equivalent to this condition on the Lie brackets. So the fact that the first Lie bracket is everywhere independent, and in this case, uh, all length minimizers, I should say uh, here to be uh, precise, joining distinct points. Are normal, OK? Projection of the Hamiltonian flow I have written before. And indeed, uh, in this case, the, the Hamiltonian can be also uh, written in this form, where the H1, H2 are just linear on fiber Hamiltonians associated with the vector fields. If D is not contact, meaning it is not contact, I mean not contact, so in this case, uh, this condition star can be false at some point, and uh, abnormal length minimizers must be contained, if any, in uh, this set here, the set where that condition is false. So notice that uh, this condition means the determinant which is equal to zero. So typically, is kind of a surface. And if you want a length minimizer, it should be a horizontal curve. So you should intersect a surface with the distribution. So typically, this is a, a line field. On, on some surface, but this is in the generic case, OK? Very good. So uh, to go towards the end of my talk of today, I just discuss another example, which is very classical, this one uh, of the Eisenberg group, where in R3 we consider this uh, uh, orthonormal basis of vector field which, as you can check very quickly, uh, produces a contact distribution. In this case, if you write down what is an horizontal curve, um, as we have written before, so a curve of yeah, standard vector is the distribution, you get out this system of differential equation. This system of differential equation is interesting because when you look to the subremanent length, which is just the integral of the square root of u1 square plus u2 square, since u1, u2 is just x dot, y dot, this is the Euclidean length of the projection onto the horizontal plane. And the z condition, thanks the z coordinate, thanks to this condition here, is just the area spanned by uh, the curve on the horizontal plane. So uh, this is a uh, uh, this is what happens in the plane x, y. You get a curve, say starting from the origin, and at every t you have a z of t, which is the area spanned by the uh, the curve and the line passing through the origin and joining the endpoint. So indeed, in this case, if you look for length minimizer, you are uh, producing. Uh, curves which minimize the Euclidean length of on the plane with a fixed area span. Okay, and these are uh, circles. Okay, of course I'm going fast on this point, but uh, these are also classical problems. So if you want uh, more details, please don't hesitate. So in this case, uh, one can uh, produce. Um, uh, these curves also analytically by studying the, the Hamiltonian flow, because uh, as we have said, uh, since the, the, the distribution is contact, the length minimizer, which are not trivial, so not con constant, are normal. 
and uh, uh, comes out as a projection of an Hamiltonian flow, which uh, is explicit in this case, because uh, since we have the expression for the two vector fields, we have an expression also for the H1, H2, I've written before, and um, is the sum of square of this HI, and uh, this HI are linear in P, so the big H is quadratic in P, so there is a homogeneity, and uh, of course, uh, H is constant along with the flow defined by its Hamiltonian flow. So indeed, what happens is that one can look to a single level set, H equal one half, and uh, mm, staying in different level set just means a different reparameterization of the same curves when projecting downstairs. Uh, if you start from the origin, in this case, the condition H equal to one half, so we should be more precise, the P uh, such that H PX, if you want, when X is the origin is one half, is just defining a cylinder in the fiber, okay? Because when X, Y, Z is zero, this quantity here is killed, and so you get PX squared plus PY squared equal one. So what happens is that you have a solution of the Hamiltonian system, uh, a solution for uh, every um, uh, uh, initial covector, let's say, element of the, of the dual space. So, uh, but in general, in dimension three, you can always write that your Hamiltonian has this form, and the level set H equal one half is always diffeomorphic to uh, a cylinder, okay? So like uh, in this uh, explicit example here. Here, you have a cylinder in the space Px, Py, Pz, okay? So you have a Pz, which is kind of a vertical variable, uh, a vertical variable of the vertical part of the covector, and the Px, Py, which stay in a circle. So um, this is a kind of a picture of uh, what we can call exponential map, because in this case, the minimizer are parameterized not with initial velocity, because you have to remember that initial velocity must stay in the uh, distribution. So we have just a two-dimensional space of admissible velocity, but we want to reach a three-dimensional set. And indeed, um, in this case, uh, the, the, say the, the, the unit uh, set of initial condition is not a sphere as a Riemannian geometry, but it is a cylinder. And the idea is that the cylinder, which is infinite, should be sent close to uh, a point when you want to describe the sphere, okay? Imagine to want to describe a small sphere of a small radius, your initial condition is a cylinder, you want to plot it close to a point. And, okay, this is not a proof, it's just a heuristic, but uh, a cylinder is not diffeomorphic to a sphere, and so you have a problem when you try to do that. And indeed, that's the picture of the image of that cylinder. And the idea is that there is a limited part of the cylinder which is sent to the true sphere, here, and then this infinite part of the cylinder should accumulate close to the initial point, okay? And when you take a, a curve here, you get something like this, which remember in the Eisenberg group, so this picture is for the Eisenberg group projects on the horizontal plane into a circle. When you go up, with the, so uh, with this PZ, what you get, you get a curve which goes up faster, but when you pass this black circle, your curve will go up too quickly and then will meet curves coming from other direction and will lose optimality, okay? So will not be in the sphere, will be in the image of this uh, cylinder, but not in the sphere. The sphere, so the set of point of distance equal to, say one, we can normalize it here, or 
it is uh, it is just the external part of this you are you are saying here okay so this is not a true justification but kind of justification for subramanian spheres not to be smooth yeah at least this singularity here. And then I will stop with this last comment with the last open problem, which is also important in this uh, theory, which is what is called the Sald conjecture in, in this setting. So the classical Sald theorem states that if you have a smooth function from Rn to Rm, which is infinity, or indeed uh, CK for K sufficiently big, then the measure of the image of the critical points is zero. So if C is a set of points in Rn where the differential of F is not subjective, then F of C, the image of this set, has measure zero in Rn here. This statement is in general false when the dimension uh, of the start the, 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 uh, the set where the function is defined as an infinite dimension. So there are examples, for instance, in the Hilbert, for a function defined in Hilbert uh, space, small L2. And uh, the, the open problem is uh, this statement, so the SAR theorem is form true for the Subramanian endpoint map. What does it mean? Since critical points for the endpoint map are uh, the controls U associated with the uh, abnormals, then you are asking if when you fix the initial point, the set reached by abnormal has measure zero or not. So indeed, this kind of uh, bad curves, because they come out from bad part of the Lagrange multipliers rule, which we cannot control very well, uh, you want to know if it's the set reached by those trajectory as measure zero or not. And at this point, you can produce two indeed questions. One is the general such conjecture. So what happens for abnormal extremas? So the curves that satisfy the necessary condition for minimizers. But then you can restrict your question to length minimizers. So not only those that satisfy the necessary condition, but the true length minimizers. So they are less, of course, and so you have a sub conjecture for minimizers asking if the set reached by abnormal length minimizer is measure zero or not. Okay, I think that this is the end of my talk for today, and I hope this was of your interest, at least for some the part of you which was not uh, familiar with this uh, domain and. Uh, Tomorrow, I will discuss uh, something more related to the three dimensional case and curvature environments. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Thank you very much for the beautiful talk. There are some cards coming, so that's nice. Uh, do we have any comments or questions from the audience?